Hi, I'm Chin Liu. And I'm Sal. And this is our next make. This week, we finished up on the details of this miter saw station. That's right. We tackled dust collection, installed T-Track, and built a one-of-a-kind stop block. To figure out the size and shape of the dust shroud, we need to add a digital representation of the miter saw to our SOLIDWORKS assembly. In the past, I would take measurements of the real-world object using tape measures, rulers, and calipers, and use them to make a very basic model of the object. This approach has always served us well, but this time, we want to try our hand at 3D scanning. A friend told us about this phone app called Polycam. It scans using a series of pictures you take with your phone's camera. You can also leverage the LiDAR technology on your phone to get more three-dimensional information during its data processing. We continue to scan the miter saw in various positions and then export an OBJ file for use in SOLIDWORKS for Makers. The level of detail scanned is amazing, allowing us to design a dust shroud that perfectly fit around the saw. With the 3D scans, I can confidently design a dust shroud that wouldn't interfere with the miter saw's range of motion. I want to experiment with a fabric shroud, so I'm starting by designing a frame to hold it. I quickly model this basic structure, and then print out a drawing that I can use to make paper templates. I use a sharp blade and a pair of scissors to cut out the pieces, and then transfer them to a piece of 3 quarter inch plywood. Being able to first lay out the parts digitally gives me a ton of confidence that they'll all fit on this scrap piece. I cut the plywood into two smaller pieces to make it easier to manage, and then cut out several parts at the bandsaw. I just take my time and carefully follow the lines. The uppermost piece of the frame calls for a bevel, so I tilt the shoe on my jigsaw and use the frame's sidewall to set the exact angle. With the piece firmly clamped to a work table, I cut the beveled curve and then move the blade back to a 90 degree position to make the rest of the cuts. I'm going to use a few pocket screws to hold this simple frame together, so I drill the holes with my jig. I just take extra care to properly position the curved parts before drilling. Then I quickly screw things together, and in the process I use the center post as a spacer to position the height of the bottom rail. As I've done in all of the other workshop builds so far, I applied a coat of primer and then two coats of red paint. Most of this frame won't be seen, but I find it a good practice to get a protective coat on all of the surfaces anyway. Now I can start to prep the opening for the dust chute. I drill a pilot hole for my router, and then use a flush trim bit to follow the opening we previously cut when building the miter station. The router can't reach all of the laminate, so I use a sharp utility knife to finish the job. To figure out how much material I'll need to make the chute and the shroud, as well as what shapes I need to cut, I use SOLIDWORKS sheet metal commands. Going this route lets me get an accurate flat pattern that I can use to cut the fabric. We start by printing out a grid of drawings that we can then tape together to make the large dust chute pattern. We cut it out with a pair of scissors and then reinforce the backside with tape. After cutting the pattern out, we trace it on the fabric using a white colored pencil. We do the same with the smaller dust shroud pattern. To strengthen the edges of the fabric in preparation for this to be stapled in place to the wooden structure, we want to create a hem. So we add an allowance for the seams by using a 3 quarter inch scrap of wood to draw a dashed line around the perimeter. This new dashed line is what we cut to. With relief cuts in the curved edges, I can properly fold the hem and hold it in place with some clips. I clip each segment in the reverse direction from the sewing direction to make sure that when this is in the sewing machine, the overlap is not caught on the foot. Working with faux leather is a tricky thing. It's high friction, so it would get stuck between the feet and the platform. And what was happening to me was I was getting this uh, rippling effect because it would get caught and I had to adjust constantly. So I worked with a hack, since I don't have a Teflon foot to make this slippery, I tried out using parchment paper, and that was able to provide this nicer, um, smoother stitch. Installing the dust chute was pretty straightforward. I used a pneumatic stapler to attach the fabric to the miter station. It's a perfect fit. I used a ring clamp to secure the bottom of the dust chute to the blast gate. It makes for a really nice tight fit as well. I used the same technique to staple the dust shroud fabric to the frame. It's much easier to do most of the fabric attachment before mounting the frame in place. Once ready, I position the frame and then drive in a few screws to secure it. As a final step, I staple the bottom of the shroud in place. In order for the miter station to function properly, we need to make sure that the bed of the saw is in line with or ever so slightly higher than the material support surfaces. When I designed this, I made sure it was going to be lower so I can come back now and add shims to get it to the perfect height. We'll start by placing a straight edge across the material support surfaces. So we're going to take a stack of index cards and place as many in that will go without much force. And then one card at a time, we'll try and get even more in. It's starting to feel a little bit of resistance, but that goes okay. Let's see if we can make one more fit. 
All right, that's about as far as it'll go. So we can take this now and use a set of calipers to dial in the exact amount. With the thickness measurement in hand, I want to also measure the feet on the miter saw. So I tilt it up on its side and rub a pencil across the foot to transfer its shape to a piece of paper. Then I jump into X Design to model a few shims. Of course, I can make shims out of a few pieces of wood cut to the right thickness, but I want my shims to also act as stop blocks that help me perfectly position the saw anytime I need to remove it and then replace it. So I take a few minutes to model two front and two rear shims, and then I print them out. I only have green filament on hand, so I quickly spray the pieces with white paint. Once dry, I can place the shims in each corner, making sure they fit snugly. And then I hold everything in place with a few clamps and screws. I'm about to cut the slot for the T-Track, so I've set up a board to act as a straight edge to guide my router. But if I'm honest, I'm a little bit nervous that I'm gonna mess things up, so I'm gonna set up a second straight edge to keep the router trapped in place. Before making the cut though, I have to set the proper depth for the bit. With the bit lowered to be flush with the tabletop, I place a piece of track under the plunge stop and then lower and tighten it. This produces perfect results, and with this setting, I make grooves for the T-Track on both sides of the miter saw. Then I set up to make shallow grooves for the measuring tapes. I set the bit depth in the exact same way and then route the grooves. The T-Track is made of aluminum, so it can be cut to length using woodworking blades. I miter one end to match the chamfer on the edge of the miter station and then screw the track in place. To precisely attach the measuring tapes, I have to first set the miter saw in place and secure it with a few screws. Then I can take a measurement from the tip of the blade's teeth to the edge of the table. I cut the tape to that measurement using a pair of scissors, remove the sticky back tape, and install it. The last thing this miter station needs is a stop block for repeat cuts. I start by making the tightening knob and locate the center of my pieces before taping them together. I drill a small pilot hole to transfer the center mark through all three pieces and then proceed to make a series of through holes and counter bores to make room for the T-nut that I'll eventually trap in this glue up. With most of the holes drilled, I lightly tap a T-nut into place to make marks where I'll drill pilot holes for the tines. This will make it much easier to fully seat the T-nut just before gluing the pieces together. I tape and clamp the pieces together and let them sit for a few hours before continuing to work on them. To draw the shape of the knob, I grab a nearby roll of Teflon tape and use the container to draw different sized arcs. I connect them with straight lines to create an oblong shape and then cut things out on the bandsaw. I take my time when working with small parts like this, and as always, I keep my fingers far from the blade. I smooth out any rough areas left by the bandsaw and then round over the edges on my tiny router table. Because the part is so small, I use a paddle to keep my hands away from the bit. The little bit of burning that's created is cleaned up with a bit more sanding. Now I can start making the actual block part of the stop block. I suppose I could just create a simple square block, but I want to see if I can amp up the design a bit. So I cut a piece of white oak to just over 20 inches long and start to make a spline that keeps the block centered in the T-Track. I plane the spline down until I get the perfect fit, and then I cut a matching groove in the bottom of the block. I just make repeating cuts until the spline fits, flipping the board around each time to keep the groove centered. After I glue and clamp the spline in place, I realize that I only need it to be in the first 8 inches of the block. So when things set up, I take it back to the table saw and trim off about 12 inches of the spline. I cleaned up the remaining bit with a chisel. Everything fits well and the knob works, but I notice that the long, narrow shape of the stop block seems to bow a bit. To correct this, I glue on a stiffening rib and clamp the stop block to the table while the glue sets up. As a last step before applying finish, I position the left side of the stop block to exactly 20 inches and cut it to length. Then I wipe on a protective coat of boiled linseed oil and let things dry for a few days. Now the miter station is complete and I can put the stop block to the test. I designed it to be reversible, so when I need to cut anything longer than 12 inches, I align the short side with the exact measurement and make my cut. But when I need to cut something shorter than 12 inches, I loosen the knob and spin the stop block around. Because I know the stop block is exactly 20 inches long, I align the short side with my measurement plus 20 inches. Of course, when cutting short pieces, I take every precaution to keep my hands safe and use an accessory like this hold down stick. We hope you enjoyed watching this week's episode. And we hope the information was useful. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on our next make.